I would like to talk with you about some of the myths that surround homosexuality, that which is known and that which is not known. Um, I am more interested in healing our wounds than I am even about understanding homosexuality. Why do I say that? Because a lot of us think that, oh, we hear people saying so-and-so comes from a very dysfunctional family. I want you to know we all come from dysfunctional families. We live in a dysfunctional world a sinful world, a fallen world. Therefore, we all are going to come from some degree of, of dysfunctionality, which tells me as a therapist that that means that we all have wounds. Now, a lot of therapists, when you go to them with homosexuality, will try to help you with your, social, uh, with your homosexuality. I do not do that. I rather get down to the issues of wounding, of hurting, and we all have that. So let's look today a little bit, though, at what's what. Homosexuality is defined by Dr. Hatterer, who is a renowned um, psychiatrist and researcher, as one who is motivated in adult life by a definite preferential erotic attraction to members of the same sex, and who usually, but not necessarily, engages in overt sexual relations with them. And for gay women, there's a stronger emotional component. So lesbianism includes all women whose sexual and emotional attractions are fulfilled by women. So that's kind of a working definition. But there are also some very, very, um, very strong myths out there. One of my pet peeves with the media is that they will take one study and report on it as though it's factual. And before you know it, it's what people think in our society. And if you know anything about research at all, you know that you cannot base anything on one study. It has to be replicated over and over and until you have all the pieces and then you can, and, and there's a specific kind of research that has to be done, which is called experimental or experiential, experimental research. That's the only accurate kind of research. Well, one day I remember hearing on the media that they found the gene that causes homosexuality. And so a whole nation began to think that homosexuality is inborn, inherited, genetic. And the problem is, is that it's not true. How do I know that? First of all, because there was only one study Secondly, God does not create and then condemn the created for something that he did. So if it's something that we're born with because of genetics, we're telling God he made us that way, and yet he condemns the very thing that he made. Poor God. I feel really sorry for him with the things that he's blamed for. So the reality is, is we are not born gay. Amen. And let us look at what does maybe happen. First of all, in that same study, they reported in identical twins that there was a 50% concordance rate. Most of the studies that were done in those early years were not accurate. And the 50% concordance rate is not true. Now, repeated studies show an average of only 6.7%. But let's say it was 50%. If they're identical twins and it's genetic, shouldn't the concordance rate be 100%? because they received the same genes. How can only half have the gene and not the other half when they're identical? So that's one big reason why they know 
that that's not true. And then it has never been replicated. There's never again been found a, quote, gene over many years of studying it. So the bad news about that is that when we have that attitude that I am born this way and there's nothing I can do about it, it becomes so fatalistic. I might as well give in to it. I might as well live the gay lifestyle because there's nothing I can do about it. And you know what? Something I've discovered is that gay activists actually use that to get money from people to fight for the gay agenda. When, if we are going to fight for something, we better make sure that it's accurate and true. Wouldn't you agree with that? So the good news is that we can change. But what is it that actually causes homosexuality? The fact is, the facts are all, all not in yet. There are research, there's research being done all over, and it goes into every direction possible, and there's not a whole lot of agreement. So nobody really knows for sure. Plus, the environmental factors that lead to homosexuality vary widely from person to person. There are many hypotheses of causes. All have some validity, but most have been discarded. The hypothesis being researched most is what um, Pastor Lamert spoke to yesterday, and that is that uh, babies in about the 15th to 26th week of gestation, uh, boy babies are bathed in testosterone, and that is what gives them the, uh, the boy brain that makes it very, very different from the girl brain. Now, here's the problem with that. Even though God does not make homosexuality, the reality is, is that we do live in a sinful planet, therefore there are certain anomalies that happen during pregnancies, certain errors. So if a boy does not receive enough testosterone during that bathing, he can be born very effeminately. If a girl, by error, receives too much testosterone, she can become more masculinized. But that doesn't cause homosexuality. It's just saying that you have a more feminine boy or a more masculine girl. But there are many feminine, effeminate boys and masculine girls who do not become homosexual. So that does not cause homosexuality. Something in the environment that's negative, that leads the person to think of themselves as being gay. Let's look at that for just a minute, because to me, that's a very important factor. Kids can be cruel. Have you noticed that? They can be such incredible bullies. And as a result, they sometimes will look at a more feminine boy and start calling them girl, or start calling them gay, or any number of other words that kids may choose to use. They can pick on that little boy or that little girl and they can be mean to them. I'll give you an illustration. There was a one, per by the way, I'll be using some stories today and I have permission to use them. You will not know who they are because I'm changing the facts around a little bit, <clears throat> but the point is the same. I once had a man who came in for therapy who was homosexual and he was very feminine and um, he told me the most incredible, painful story. He said when he was a little boy, he was very attached to his mom because his dad was gone. He was very slightly built, and he was also very musically inclined. 
And because of that, the other boys began to really tease him and call him a girly girl. And one day, they found him on the way home from school, and they knocked him down, beat him up, pulled down his pants, and started to do all sorts of unmentionables to this little guy. He wasn't even 10 years old. And he hated it. And every day, he'd go home crying, but he would not tell his mother what was going on because he was afraid then the kids would be even worse to him. And one day, as he was being sexually abused, he discovered it was a pleasurable feeling. Well, you know, God designed us so that touch can be very pleasurable. And as a result, with the boys calling him gay and a girl, he began to think of himself as gay. Now, don't... Inter don't um, think that that isn't a powerful, powerful thing. Did you know that the very first experience that you have with sex can set the tone for your life all the rest of your life? I once had a man who, when he was a little boy, had never experienced erection or ejaculation. And one day, he stubbed his toe really, really badly. And as a result, he had an erection from it because that can happen. Pain and pleasure is very similar in some ways. And he ejaculated for the first time for the remainder of his life. Every time he would stub his toe, he would have an erection and ejaculate. Now, you may think that's really weird. And in some ways, it, it is different from anything we've ever heard. But the point I'm making is that our first sexual experience can really set the tone for our lives. If you have a bad sexual experience, and by the way, many, many boys were sexually abused. 67% of gay men were, sex were sexually abused as children. And because you feel pleasure, and the, if the older person or the other person tells you that proves that you're gay, what will you begin to think of yourself? I'm gay. It's the same with women. A lot of women. In fact, in my own experience as a therapist, every 100% of men and women that I've worked with over 30 years were sexually abused as children. So if you have the, gen uh, not the genetic, but the, uh, the anomaly of being born more masculine as a girl and more feminine as a boy, and you have that environmental situation of pain, the two working together is likely what's at the root of homosexuality. It doesn't mean that everyone was. But there are other environmental conditions. Another situation of another boy was that when he was born, at eight months old, his parents divorced. And his mom had to go out to work and had three other kids besides. So the mother asked her mother if she would take care of her little boy. Well, the mother lived about 150 miles away. So she took her home. She took the little boy home with her. Now, he was a perfectly normal little boy. In fact, looked very boy. And so not at all effeminate. And when he took him, when she took him to her home, she had two daughters. So there were three women in the home. And the little boy began to identify with the females that were around him. And he began to do things that they did and walk like they did. And the mom was too old to get him real involved. She, in fact, she didn't even drive a car. So he was not involved with men at all. Then he went back to live with his mom when he was about nine or 10 years old. And she couldn't deal with him. She couldn't handle how he was acting. So she got him involved with an older man to try to give him some idea of what a man is like. And that older man 
raped him. As a result, the older man told him, you enjoyed that, didn't you? Because he was kind of a mentor to him. Now let me ask you the question. Is that little boy homosexual because he was born that way? Or is he homosexual because of the treatment that he received at the hands of other people? You see, we, so when I'm dealing with people, I get down into those root issues. Because to me, homosexuality is a symptom. And when you're in therapy, you should never be working on the symptom, but on the cause. My son-in-law is a surgeon. If people come into him and say, oh, I've been having such a horrible headache, he sends them and gets an MRI done. And if he discovers a brain tumor, he's not, he's not a neurosurgeon, but if he discovers a brain tumor, he doesn't just say to the person, well, here, here's some aspirin. Take the aspirin and go home, you'll be fine. No, you wouldn't be satisfied with that. You would say, get that thing out. So rather, he sends him to a neurosurgeon. The guy has surgery, and the tumor is removed. When you deal with the symptom of homosexuality, you're dealing with a brain tumor with the headache, but not with the tumor. You see? So we need to get down to the root causes, the pain that all of us experience in life. The other thing is, the other myth is that homosexuality can never change, and it's harmful to a person to try to change it. And again, my own personal philosophy is you deal with the root issues, the causes, and then when you do, you are healed from the inside out. And when you're healed, that's the only time you can make accurate decisions for your life. You cannot make a decision based upon the symptoms that you're having that are brought upon you by other people. You cannot do that. You must be healed. And if you want to become, whether you're gay or not, we all have those wounds. If you want to become all that God would have you to be and have health in your life and in your family, then we need to root out those things that trouble us. And we'll be talking about that in just a minute. I've noticed that some individuals spontaneously alter once they've been healed. They begin to think to themselves, I don't need this in my life. I really don't. And so then they begin to have other desires. But on the other hand, some believe they cannot change. And if you believe you cannot change, you will not change. Some do not want to change. They like that lifestyle. And who am I to tell them that they have to? So that's why I do not focus on the homosexuality. I focus on the causes. And if they don't want to change, that is not my responsibility, nor is it my right to try to tell them otherwise. But I am convinced that all individuals can change any behavior, provided they really want to, they're willing to put forth the effort and do the personal work that's required, and that they believe God's word. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know, I, have, I see a lot of marital couples in therapy. And people will often say to me, do you think that our marriage can change, that, I can, that we can really have a healthy marriage? My answer is always yes, irrespective of how horrible the relation and let me tell you, there are times I question my own belief. <laughs> but the reality is, is I've seen the most unlikely people turn out with having really great marriages. But it takes the same thing. You really have to want it. You have to be willing to put forth the effort and do the personal work that's required. 
and then have a strong faith and belief that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, at the root of all of our difficulties is this one little four-letter word, which I hope you can see, and that word is loss. We live in a sinful planet, so therefore we're all going to experience losses. Let's look a look, take a look at what that means. One type of loss is having something and having it taken from us. We understand that kind of loss because it's the loss of death and divorce and uh, mo monetary uh, setbacks and so forth. So we understand that one. But then there are so many other kind of uh, losses that we don't think so much about. Not having something that you should have. All children have the right to certain things, such as medical care, dental care, and so forth. But there are kids who do not have their needs met. Those are serious losses that they will carry the effects of into adulthood. I know I used to, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and I have seen very poor children who will have to go to school in their mother's high heel shoes because they have no shoes. And there are kids who wanted to have their homework done but couldn't because their parents couldn't afford to buy them the loose leaf paper that was required. Those are losses. And they will suffer with some of those losses the rest of their lives. See, psychologists tell us that by the time we're born until five, and then again at puberty, which by the way, puberty is another time where a boy receives the testosterone bath in their brains. And so even if you were born one way, you can change that again at puberty unless you've been offended. But psychologists tell us that by the time we're born until we're five, or at least until puberty, we are growing in a certain way, straight, narrow. And then things happen to us, and it pushes us off this way. So we become who we are at a very young age, and then we spend the remainder of our lives defending it. And we do have two choices when we're confronted with issues. We can either become defensive and cling to our own beliefs and say, this is how I want to be and I don't intend to change. Or we can become humbled by it and at the foot of the cross recognize that the Lord can do all things to help us, to strengthen us so that we can become all that he would have us be, not what we want to be. The third kind of loss are the insults that are piled upon us to our persons, to our psyches, at the hands of other people. That's a horrific loss, and it probably is the one that causes us the most pain. And yet it's also the one that we least desire looking at and trying to change. And then there's the loss of self-esteem through our own choices. When we cut across our own consciences and do things against our own mores, that affects us deeply, and it's a loss to who we are. <clears throat> and then there is the loss of unresolved shame or guilt. Shame is for who we are. Guilt is for what we do. And did you know that there are two kinds of guilt? Some guilt is sent to us by the Holy Spirit for when we've really done wrong and broken God's law, then we're supposed to feel guilt because our guilt is meant to lead us to the foot of the cross in repentance and change. The other kind of guilt is a false guilt, a pseudo guilt, a guilt that's placed upon us by guilt producing parents and teachers and so forth. So guilt can be defined as anything that can be related to the breaking of God's law. 
If it is not related to that, then it's a fake guilt, and we can let that go. But shame is for who we are, and many of us carry shame around, and we don't need to when we begin to look at ourselves the way God looks at us. And then there is also the loss of the respect of those who matter to us. Those are fantastically heavy losses that we come into adulthood bearing in our lives. And we don't have to because God has already forgiven us and we need to forgive ourselves. All loss, however, no matter what kind it is, creates pain, deep pain and hurt. The greater the loss, the greater the pain. Now, God has a remedy for how to take care of it. But society does, too. Society's remedy is to say, don't talk about it. It's in the past. Repress it. Put it away. The more you think about it, the worse it is. That's society's. And that's how we generally handle our, our pain. We don't talk about it. You know, in the, old, in the, in the uh, Jewish days of Jesus and in the Old Testament, people knew how to grieve. They really did. But we don't. So we repress. That's not grief. So God's remedy is an entirely different thing, and we'll be talking about that. Did you know studies have been done on tears? Because God's remedy is to grieve the loss that we've experienced, to open it up, to cut it up, to view it, to talk about it, to bring it out into the open. It's as though you have a huge boil on your leg. You have two choices about that boil. You can go in and have it lanced, and it hurts. But then it begins to heal because it's drained out. The other remedy is to leave it alone, and then that poison can go inside and create sepsis, and you can die. We have those same choices in our emotional lives. We can cut the boil by bringing it all out into the open and dealing with it. It's going to hurt, but then it heals. The other choice is to leave it alone, and when we leave it alone, it creates an emotional sepsis, and it skews who we are. So while you were growing like this, if you keep that boil, you will grow out like that, and you are not the person that God intended you to be. You are not who he created you to be if you hold on to those things. Studies have been done on tears. They've actually collected them to see what's, what's in them. Do you know that they found all sorts of toxins in tears? And if those toxins are not released, they go into our bodies and actually create certain diseases, certain forms of cancer, heart illness, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And that's why God's remedy is for us to grieve the losses that we've experienced so that he can heal us. If we do not, we are choosing society's remedy, which is to repress and put inside and hurt us. Because all loss, no matter how small or big, must be grieved in order to have the wound healed and the cup of pain emptied out if you could picture inside of you, it's not there, obviously, but if you could picture inside of you a cup that every time something bad happens, that cup begins to fill up and fill up and fill up until it's full. Where is the room to contain the issues of today? We don't have room. And so it begins to create disease or it falls out as anger or 
one of the other emotions that we'll be looking at. So we must empty out the cup so that there's room for us to deal with the problems of today. If we do not, we begin to develop certain symptoms. Some of the symptoms of ungrieved loss is anger, depression, anxiety, and fear. We can't hold on to hurt for very long. It's a very hot emotion. So we switch it over to more familiar emotions that we can deal with. And these are the four that typically people switch hurt over into. They're symptoms. They're normal reactions to ungrieved loss. But they're still symptoms of the ungrieved loss. And if we ignore it, then anger gets worse on a progressive manner. So it can become a state of anger, bitterness, rage, violence, homicidal ideation, and finally homicide. When I was doing my postdoctoral hours, I did it at a prison in California. And I specifically worked with murderers that had psychiatric problems, and I worked with high-risk sex offenders. If you really got down into the issues of their lives, you would discover tons of ungrieved loss. I mean, it was no wonder that they wound up where they were because people had no idea how to help these children, or if they did, they didn't and didn't care. And so they would come into prison with tons and tons of ungrieved lo losses which portrayed themselves as anger. But anger isn't the only one. Depression, some people can go that route. And depression is nothing more than a symptom of anger. You know, a lot of people say depression is anger turned inward. No, it's not. It's a symptom of hurt. So let me ask you, is it wise to send a person, for example, to anger management? No, they're too angry to handle their anger through managing it. So you have to get down into the hurt. So the hurt is resolved, and then they don't get angry. The same is true with depression. I see so many people who are depressed being handed a pill. Now, I'm not opposed to antidepressants. There are times when it's necessary. But never take an antidepressant unless you're also in therapy. Because otherwise, you're not dealing with the underlying hurt. So how do you know when you're depressed? It may start out as just the blues. You're not happy with life. And then it becomes dysthymia, which is a low-grade depression that's always there. It can become a major depression where you either can't get out of bed or you won't get out of bed and you eat too much or don't eat anything <clears throat> with a whole bunch of other symptoms to it. But a lot of people think if they're up working around and cleaning and going to work that they're not depressed. But there is such a thing as called walking depression or smiling depression where you may be smiling at other people and deep down you're wounded and hurt and depressed and you're certainly not where God would have you be. And then finally, the, there is suicidal ideation and even suicide. Those are symptoms of loss and hurt. But it may also turn into anxiety where at first you just feel kind of nervous and tense but it can become a myriad of other kinds of diagnoses. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, panic attacks, numerous other anxiety issues, and the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Health Professionals, is just replete with anxiety disorders. But the most important one is that anxiety also creates addictions. 
What is the purpose of an addiction? The purpose of an addiction is to keep us from feeling the pain from the losses that we've experienced in life. The problem is, is that eventually the, the uh, addiction causes more problems than the original hurt. And now you've got a double whammy to deal with. And when we speak of addictions, we often will think of cigarette smoking and alcohol, but we can be addicted to anything that will help us to not feel. So we can be addicted to doing good. We can be addicted to food. We can be addicted to all sorts of sexual addictions, pornography, having affairs outside your home, having all sorts of desires that shouldn't be there. And what is the purpose of that? Is to forget the pain that perhaps other people have done to us. And that is not God's way. God's way is to open it up, bring it out to the surface, and deal with it. We must do the work to become healthy. And then another symptom is fear, generalized fear, just afraid of everything, fear of being found out. So we go through all of these horrible feelings. Maybe somebody will know. How will that work? How is that going to affect my family? And we suffer with fear, fear of trying new things, and then finally phobias. And finally, agoraphobia, where we're afraid to even venture outside our homes. You know, that's not how God wants us to live, is it? He says, I want you to have the joy and the peace of my love in your heart. We cannot have that if we've replaced it with all of these symptoms in order to keep ourselves stable. But we're not really. True healing is what brings us true stability and brings us to the point where we can become all that God would have us be. And I'm speaking to all of us, including myself, when I say that. God wants us to have the freedom from all of this stuff. If the sun shall set you free, what? You shall be free indeed. The government doesn't give us freedom. The government is there to protect our freedom. But our freedom from God is an entirely different thing. He wants us to be free from within. He wants us to grow from within. When my little girl was two years old, she was very precocious, and we, we had rose bushes out in our backyard, and she went out one day and picked a rose bud just a little bud. And she did this and tried to open it up. And she said to me, Mommy, how come when I open the rose, it dies? But when Jesus opens it, it becomes big and beautiful. And before I had a chance to answer, she said, I know why. It's because Jesus does it from the inside out. <laughs> And that's what he wants to do with us. He wants us to have healing from inside so that we can become all that he would have us be. So let's now, instead of talking about all the problems, let's look at some solutions. Solutions that therapists need to be working with you on, but which comes from the word of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't. We are not dealing with just us. We're, uh, many times when we become Christians, we get very harassed by the enemy. And so we have to recognize that whatever it is that we choose to do with our healing, that we must have God by our sides, giving us the power and the strength to be able to do it. And also, remembering in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. We have nothing to fear 
if the Lord is walking by our side, do we? We don't. We have nothing to fear. Therapy is very important in healing, but I would advise you about going to therapy to make sure that you have a Christian therapist who wants for you what you want for you. A therapist, it is unethical if a therapist tries to get you to do things his or her way. You must work within the framework of the person's own belief system. And if you do not, that's unethical, and in some cases, even illegal. So find a therapist, interview them, get on the phone, find out what their philosophy is. And when you find the person that you believe will fit with you, then go to that person and don't be afraid to open up. They're duty bound to keep your confidences. There are only three times when they must report. One is if you tell them that you've sexually or physically abused a child or an elderly person, they're required to report that. One is if you tell them that you're going to kill somebody, they're required to tell the person that you're threatening and the police. And the third thing is when you're suicidal. It's the, it's the therapist's discretion to be able to break confidence and to get you help. Other than that, you must feel free to open up once you learn to trust that person and to be able to spit out all the horrible things that may have happened to you over your life and little by little empty out that cup so that you have room for the issues of today. Again, I said this earlier, but I think it bears repeating. Recognize that when we're confronted with issues in our lives that we have two choices. One is to become defensive. And defensive is a mechanism that keeps you from changing. So if we become defensive, we really want to stick to our own ways and our own thoughts and beliefs. Or the second choice we have is to come in meekness to the Lord for him to show us and to be with us as we walk toward the path of healing. And don't be afraid to open up those issues. Even though they create pain, it's okay. Nobody ever died from dealing with feelings. I once had a client who said to me, I can't continue therapy. And I go, why not? He says, if I keep on working on these issues, I'm going to have a heart attack. And I said to him, you know, nobody ever died from dealing with feelings. You may die if you don't deal with them <laughs> through a heart attack, but nobody died from dealing with their feelings. So you don't need to worry about that. It's painful, but we can withstand pain when you know that at the end of the road, there's going to be healing. I've been through it myself. I never ask my, ther my clients to do something I haven't been willing to do. And I can't begin to tell you the difference it's made in my life. So if you really want to change the issues that are underlying our feelings of today, you must open up those issues and begin to dump them up, dump them out by working them through. After you've done all of that, by the way, it doesn't necessarily take a therapist you can do the work on your own. You can journal. Write a, I'll, I'll give you a little formula. You write a list of all of the things that have happened to you through your life that you might consider loss that have caused you pain. And then you start writing about them. The issue is, is to get it out. Whether you get it out with a therapist and burst that bubble, or whether you talk to your friends on a consistent basis, or whether you journal, or all three. 
but the need is to empty the cup. And when all of that is done, you begin to forgive the person and persons who wounded you, even if that person is you. Now, one time I did a seminar on forgiveness, and there were about 300 people in the room, and I asked them to write down their definition of the word forgiveness. Guess how many definitions I got? About 20. And really, for our purposes, there's just one. Forgiveness simply means to work through the issues until you can let them go. Have you ever told a story so many times that you get sick of telling it? I once saw a police officer, a female police officer, who was involved in a shootout, and her male partner got so frightened, he wet his pants and ran. And she was left having to go through a shootout with about four gang members. So the police department sent her to me so that I could help her work through her PTSD. And the first day, I had her tell the story 13 times, each time filling in information, because you know, she just gave a surface. And then the next time she came, I had her tell the story again and added more details. This went on for about 10 sessions where each time she was getting deeper and deeper and deeper into her pain. Finally, the 11th time she came back and she said to me, I don't want to talk about this anymore. And so I said, look inside. How are, how are you feeling about the whole thing? She goes, it's fine. I don't feel anything. And her PTSD was gone. And then we could move on to other issues. But that's what it takes. That's the known remedy for PTSD, is to get it out and talk about it and talk about it and write about it and do it some more until finally you don't have any negative feelings about it. Then when that happens, you're ready to forgive. And you forgive by simply giving it over to the Lord for judgment because we are not the judges even of our own self. You know, it's very interesting to me within the church. You know how in Revelation it talks about the angel standing there with the book of life and saying, who can open the book? And it's silent. And finally, the little spotless lamb comes and the heavenly host begins to sing, worthy is the lamb. Why is he worthy? Because he's the only sinless one. Therefore, he is the only one worthy to judge. We do not have that right. And what I've discovered over the years is that the more judgmental a person tends to be toward those who are around them who are sinning not as they sin, because you know that's the rule, Sin as I sin, otherwise don't sin at all. <laughs> so I've discovered that almost always they have something inside that they're struggling with. And if I can get the perspective off onto you, nobody has to look at me. But that's not God's way. Isn't it interesting that we talk about the mark of the beast and that the two issues is that he will think to change times and laws. And the other one is that he will stand in the place of God as though he were God. So we focus on the thinking to change times and laws. But is it possible that as Christians, we are actually participating in the beast power when we stand in the place of God as though we were God, who alone is worthy to judge? Only Jesus, because he is God and he is a sinless God. We have no right to judge. And when we do, we may be participating in the beast power. Think about that. I think that's a very serious thing. 
So when we are at the point of forgiveness and we say, I can forgive this particular thing, then we write by that thing, forgiven, and the date. And then we give it over to the Lord. Is it five minutes? And then we must work through our issues with God directing our paths. If the Son shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. Forgiveness, by the way, is for you. Otherwise, you're twice hurt. First, you're hurt by the person who hurt you, and now you're hurting you by holding on to it. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation, but it can open the door to reconciliation at the proper time. Now, is there a biblical perspective to that? Yes. When Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we're told that that prayer covers all sin from Adam until the end of time. We're all under an umbrella of forgiveness. Praise God for that. Now we have to forgive us. But because we're all under an umbrella of forgiveness, are we all going to be saved? No. It requires something on our part. It requires repentance. And repentance means that we feel the sorrow for what we did, but it also means that we turn from it. So it's a two-pronged thing. Feeling the sorrow, turning from it. When Jesus hung on the cross and prayed, Father, forgive them, where was he the night before? In Gethsemane. And what was he doing there? He was receiving onto himself all the losses that sin had brought into this world. He received that into his own being and he grieved it. He grieved what sin had done. And when he grieved, he, he sweat drops of blood and an angel had to come and strengthen him. And when he was finished with that work, he was able to go to Calvary and pray, Father, forgive them. And that's what we need to do. We need to first grieve our losses and then forgive and you don't always reconcile with the person. Sometimes it's a dangerous thing to do. But if you do, you must wait until that person repents so it never happens again. And my prayer for you today is that you will take this to heart and begin to work on the issues that so easily beset us all until we can become all that God would have us to be. Don't focus on the symptom, focus on the cause. The Lord bless you as you begin your journey.